Hello everyone and welcome to Unheard. I'm Freddie Sayers. Robert Kennedy Jr. was nine years old when his uncle, President Jack Kennedy, was assassinated. He was 14 when his father, Senator Bobby Kennedy, was himself assassinated on the cusp of what was starting to look like a historic victory. For decades, RFK Jr. was himself a hero of the democratic establishment, advocating on behalf of environmental causes such as reducing pollution in rivers and waterways, but when he moved into more controversial areas, such as questions about the safety of vaccines, he became an outlier, the black sheep of the Kennedy family. To many people, his views on vaccines in particular have made him somewhat untouchable. In fact, I'm pretty sure after this interview, I will get messages asking why I'm quote unquote platforming someone who is committed to spreading misinformation. Well. First of all, we don't believe in the concept of no platforming at Unheard. We think it's stupid. Journalists are there to investigate and challenge views. So if this is the way you think, you probably should tune out now. Also, he's running for president, challenging Joe Biden for the Democratic nomination, and is already polling at 20% of voters of the governing party. So it seems a pretty important exercise to try to understand what he really thinks about the world. He joins me now. Welcome, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, thanks for having me. So I absolutely do not want to get bogged down in the vaccines question. It feels like to spend our time litigating that when you're so much on the record about it would be a waste of time, but I feel we have to address it. I notice that it was almost absent from your um, long campaign launch speech. Are, are you making the decision to talk less about vaccines for, for this campaign? And are you being advised to lay it to one side for now? My approach is that I'm not, unless I'm talking to a, a group that I specifically wants to talk about that issue, like doctors groups or whatever, which I occasionally get invited to, I would say more than occasionally, um, I would not lead with this issue. So I want, you know, my, I, the issues that I want to lead with are the issues I talked about in my speech. Um, if somebody asks me about vaccines, I'm going to tell them the truth. Uh, but, you know, it's an issue that I think uh, most Americans are um, are not, it's not on their, their the top list of issues. And I think, you know, there are a lot of other issues that, that are important and that we ought to be talking about. I guess it's going to sort of plague you somewhat because every interview will start with, you know, there's it's almost like a, a, a something that has to be said now. I saw there was an ABC interview with you that first of all said a few uh, kind of, phrases that have become commonplace about vaccines and then they actually edited out chunks of the interview when you were talking about it which they thought was misinformation. I guess this would be my question. What would your message be to mainstream Democrats who are interested in some of the things you're saying but sort of have have made their decision about you based on the vaccines question and then maybe they're angry with you, maybe they feel it was irresponsible or and you're probably not going to change their mind on the substance between now and the election day. What's your message to those voters? You know, I'm talking about other issues, issues that I think most, Ameri most Americans and probably most Democrats are concerned about, um, which is the systematic gutting of the middle class, the elevation of, um, of corporations, uh, and, I, and particularly polluting corporations and, you know, from the financial industry, from the military industrial complex, the, this kind of corrupt merger of the state and corporate power, which is uh, systematically hollowing out the American middle class through wars, through, you know, bank bailouts, through lockdowns, et cetera, where we're just printing money to make billionaires richer and, uh, you know, the the uh, the American middle class during the the COVID lockdown, there was a three a four point four trillion dollar shift in wealth from the middle American middle class to this this new oligarchy of uh, of of uh, billionaires. We created five hundred new billionaires with the lockdown, and the billionaires that we already had increased their wealth by thirty percent. Um. That's just one of the assaults. And then, you know, you go to the bailout of the Silicon Valley Bank uh, and the, you know, the, the war in Ukraine, which is costing us 113 billion. The war in Iraq and the wars that followed that have cost us 8 trillion. 
the total cost of the lockdowns was 16 trillion and we got nothing for any we didn't get anything for the, for all those wars we fought the 8 trillion dollars we got zero we got worse than nothing and the lockdowns of course we got nothing for so that's 24 trillion dollars in total and you know is it any wonder that we don't have a middle class left in the United States of America and it, unless we rebuild the middle class and rebuild our economy at home, our national security is going to fail and our democracy is failing. You cannot have democracy very long when you've got high concentrations of wealth in the same place with widespread poverty. This word corporatism that uh, you, you're using quite a lot, I guess most people would know, not really know what that means. What do you mean by it exactly? It's a sense that somehow the, the state and big money in the form of corporations have become too close and you want to put some more space between them. It's the domination of government, and particularly democratic, democratic governments, by corporate power. And what, were the, what are the examples in your head that are most egregious of that? Well, I could go on about that all day because I've spent 40 years litigating against the, uh, against the agencies, you know, the, the regulatory agencies in the United States. So I can tell you that EPA is effectively run by uh, the oil industry, the coal industry, and the pesticide industry. When we sued, when I, you know, I was on that trial team that brought the Monsanto cases, and we, you know, ended up uh, with a, a thirteen billion dollar settlement against after winning three trials. Um, but during those trials, we uncovered through discovery email traffic going back years that showed that the head of the pesticide division at EPA was secretly working for Monsanto and was running that agency to uh, to promote the mercantile ambitions of that business rather than the public interest. He was killing studies, he was fixing studies, he was ghostwriting studies. And that's, that's true throughout the agencies. I mean, if you look at the pharmaceutical agent um, industry in our country, it runs FDA. FDA gets 50% of its budget from Big Pharma. Um, the CDC spends half of its budget purchasing vaccines from Big Pharma and then distributing it. So it is a partner. And NIH uh, essentially is just an incubator for new pharmaceutical products. It, it doesn't really do the kind of basic research that we want them to be doing about where are all these diseases, these chronic diseases and, and allergic diseases coming from, and autoimmune disease and neurological disease. Why are we seeing this explosion? Now, those kind of studies don't get done. Studies that do get done are studies that develop pharmaceutical products, and then NIH collects royalties when the pharma company sells those products. So you have the regulator that you know is essentially a partner with the regulated industry. Um, the, the DOT is run by the railroads in our country and by the airlines. Uh, the banks have cor utterly corrupted the SEC, um, and you know, and they, of course. The, and the media has corrupted the FEC. With all these different examples, um, is it your sense, and I, I'm trying to draw a distinction here, between actual corruption? I mean, do you feel like there are individuals within these agencies who are improperly, maybe even illegally, benefiting from these kind of corporate ties? Or is it more of a general sense that they come from the same kind of class, there's a revolving door between those positions, and they tend to sign up to the same way of viewing the world? It's both, you know. I mean, it, it's it's legal legalized bribery and illegalized bribery. It's both things, and they and you know they get rewarded when they leave. I mean, the the rules governing conflicts of interest are just ignored, and that's illegal. But they're just systematically ignored. And then you know the rules started out not strong enough to really to protect the public interest. So you you have both things going on. You have uh, honest, you know, you have honest, what they call honest graft and dishonest graft. <laughs> so this sounds like a very kind of a traditional left of center critique of of these kinds of bodies, but. You're now being accused of being right wing, or there's some confusion about, you know, where where you come from politically. Do you, do you think concepts of left and right are less useful than they used to be? Do you think there's a kind of horseshoe happening within politics? Well, I would say this: that I consider myself a traditional Kennedy liberal. 
I don't know any of the values that my uncle John Kennedy um, harbored or my uh, my father shared that I don't share. So you know they were um, and they were they had antipathy and uh, and suspicion of of war and the military industrial complex. They did not want corporations running the American government. Um, they were completely against censorship. Uh, they were they were against the use of fear as a governing tool, and they spoke out of it, about it often. I um, mean, you go down the list of the things that they believe in, and I don't think that there's really any daylight between me and what they believed. Uh, so uh, I would say it's traditional liberal, but I do think that there is a growing coalition of the left and right in our country, of populist forces on the left and right that are convening now and that are, you know, finding common ground. And I think that that really is probably the only thing that is going to rescue American democracy. So you're quite open about hoping to get interest from potentially conservative voters as well. Is, is that the uh, idea? Uh, you know what? I always have been when I, I spent... 35 years is probably the leading and arguably, you know, and I don't want to toot my own horn, but as arguably the leading environmentalist in the country. And I was the only environmentalist who was going on Fox News constantly on Sean Hannity, on Neil Cavuto, on Bill O'Reilly, on Tucker Carlson. People and people would say to me, you're legitimizing those platforms by going on there. And I said, I'm not Given, I'm, a, I'm not compromising my values when I go on there. I'm talking to their audiences, and I want to speak to their audiences. How are we going to persuade people? How are we going to end the polarization if we're not talking to each other? So I'll go on any, you know, I'll go on any platform. The only platforms I won't go on are ones that, you know, my wife just uh, can't live with. So, but I. You know, if it was up to me, I would go on Steve Bannon and I would go on, you know, I, I would even go on Alex Jones um, because I, I want to talk to those audiences. And I, you know, I think there there's a rebellion happening in our country now. There's a populist rebellion. And if we don't capture that rebellion or the, you know, if, for, the, for the forces of idealism, and for the force the forces of generosity and kindness and you know and making our country an exemplary nation again somebody else is going to is going to take the hijack that rebellion for much darker purposes and uh, and I don't think it's a good idea to say we're not going to talk to american populists because they're deplorable you know, they're Americans. There are they're they're part. There are brothers and sisters, and we need to listen to them. And their backs are against the wall because of policies that have come down from both Republican and Democratic parties. One name that you you didn't mention there, but is being talked about quite a lot at the moment, is uh, Tucker Carlson, who obviously lost his job in the last week. But he tends to surprisingly agree with you about quite a lot of things, even though he's thought of as a right wing conservative. What is your view of Tucker Carlson? I, I think Tucker is a, now at this point, and you know, by the way, there was nobody during most of his career who was more uh, critical of Tucker Carlson than I am of his policies. I would still go on his show because I want to talk to his audience. Uh, but I think uh, Tucker has evolved over the past three years into probably one of the leading populist voices in our country. So, uh, and you know, he's talking. He's one of the only people on American. Uh, television that's talking about free speech is extraordinary because it used to be when I was growing up that the people who were most militant, who were the First Amendment absolutists, were the were journalists. And you know, journalists do not seem the average American journalist seems not the least bit concerned by government orchestrated censorship today. It's very very strange. Obviously, you are trying to win the Democratic nomination. In is there any world? in which you would um, actually do some kind of deal with Tucker Carlson? I mean, it's been speculated there could be a surprise cross-party ticket involving both of your names. Is that something you would ever yeah, I, I would not. I wouldn't speculate about any of that. I can't see Tucker Carlson running as a Democrat, and I'm running as a Democrat. And is it worth saying, if you're not successful in the primary, whether you would consider running as an independent? or? And I, I intend to be successful. I don't have a plan B. One 
Um, there are some issues, I guess, where you and someone like Tucker Carlson might still disagree quite strongly. Um, I don't have a very strong sense of your views on, on the, some of the more culture worry issues, uh, you know, issues of gender, for example. I know you've said that um, you believe biological males should not compete in women's sport, but is your view generally that the, the Democratic Party has become too, quote unquote, woke on those things and has lost sight of reality? Or, or do you take a more mainstream Democrat position? I, you know, I, I would not, uh, I'm not going to cast judgment on, you know, on a kind of a generalized description of the Democratic Party or where it is today. If you ask me what I feel about an issue, I'm happy to talk about it. I feel like, you know, we should take a common sense approach to these issues and, um, and you know, to all issues. And and by the way, I, you know, I don't even feel there's a lot of issues that I would have nothing to do with this president and that are very divisive. And there's no reason um, for me to comment on them because I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out ways to, uh, to find, you know, to to emphasize the values that we have in common rather than the issues that are tearing our country apart. So I don't feel the need to, to take a position on every issue. And if it's an issue that I will have nothing to do with on a federal, you know, as president, then I'm not uh, very unlikely to take a position on it. Let, let me be specific then. The concept of equity, which President Biden talks about a lot, is, is the idea that, and it's really quite central to his ideas about governing, which is that racial and other minority groups should be kind of retrofitted into positions um, via quota rather than just through a normal meritocratic process. And it needs that extra um, effort. Do, do you agree with the principle of equity or do you take a more... Um, I wouldn't agree. I wouldn't agree with the... Um the the policy in that you just described i think you know my family has been deeply involved in the civil rights movement and i've been involved with um with environmental justice issues from my first case was representing the naacp um in 2001 i spent the entire summer in maximum security prison in puerto rico uh, for a civil disobedience that I did in in conjunction with a case that I brought defending the poorest um, black and Hispanic uh, population in America, probably arguably the population of Vieques. I've brought uh, probably as many environmental justice cases during my career as anybody else, and I understand um, that, you know, there is institutional racism in our country. It, you know, you see it in many police departments, although not all of them, and certainly not all police are are racist, but it is a huge problem. Uh, but also, you know, the, the uh, blacks in our country are living not only with the legacy of slavery, but the legacy of of another hundred years of Jim Crow and, uh, you know, of, of having their leaders systematically murdered um, on 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 a on a you know on a local level and on a national level, and those are things. And then being redlined, being you know, uh, in the two thousand eight um, uh, securities mortgage securities collapse, it was it was black homeowners who were targeted first by those banks and who were uh, and whose equity those communities were robbed of equity at that point when we closed all of the community hospitals in our country again in the mid 2000s it was black communities with it closed so i think we need to you know we need to figure out ways uh, to make sure that those communities are participating in the american experiment with self i guess the, the the question really and i do think it's an important philosophical one for a potential president is is the best way to address those inequalities through trying to improve equality of opportunity, which would be a more classical liberal, I suppose, viewpoint? Or do you think, um, for example, let's be really specific, when the president announced that he was going to find an African-American female to fill the latest Supreme Court vacancy before having started the selection process, did that make you uncomfortable in a, as you call it, traditional Kennedy liberal sense that it wasn't an open meritocratic choice or did you feel actually yes that is the right thing to do 
Well, you know, I listen, I, I'm not going to second guess President Biden on that choice. I, I can say again that I've sat for 20 years on the board of Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration, which was the, the, the first community development corporation in our country. And I watched that by, by bringing capital and, and bringing mentorship into one of the poorest black communities in this country, we saw a renaissance in in Bedford Stuyvesant because of that. And I think that, you know, um, uh, uh, black Americans want, they want, you know, want, rep- want to feel represented. And I think a black child ought to be look, able to look at our cabinet and our courts and be able to see people that they, you know, uh, a possibility of positions that they can aspire to. But I also think that our real target needs to be getting capital into those communities, getting home ownership more widespread in those communities, which is, again, a source of capital and uh, reducing crime, making health care available and all of those things that will invite black Americans into the American experience. Let me ask you about um, climate and the environment, which is a, a lifelong issue for you. Um, it's been interesting to observe in the last few years in particular how that has shifted from being an anti-establishment position to care deeply about those things and feel like it's the number one priority to a pretty kind of establishment, maybe even corporate endorsed position. Um, do you think there is a sort of good version of the green movement and a more corporate sort of Davos style version of the green movement? And, and how would you distinguish between them if so? Yeah, I would say definitely that that's happened, that, you know, um, climate has become polarized, even more polarized than ever and polarized um, and with good reason, I think that it's you know that the uh, the crisis has been to some extent co-opted by Bill Gates, by the World Economic Forum, and all the you know the crowd, the Billionaires Boys Club, and Davos, um, in the same way that the COVID crisis was appropriated by them to make themselves richer, to impose totalitarian controls on society, um, and to uh, and to uh, stratify our society with, you know, with a group of very, very powerful and wealthy people at the top. And then, you know, the vast majority of of human beings with very little power and uh, very little sovereignty over their own lives. And every crisis is an opportunity for those forces to clamp down controls. And then you also see with climate that a lot of there's been a shift from habitat preservation, from uh, from uh, regenerative farming uh, to um, and and trying to reduce uh, the power of the carbon industry, which is also spewing toxics. We, you know, we need to reduce carbon, whether you believe in uh, in climate change or not, because anywhere there's carbon, there's also mercury, there's ozone particulates, there's aluminum, there's all these other kind of really horrible toxins that come from uh, burning hydrocarbons. But what you're seeing is a shift away from those concerns and more towards carbon capture, which, uh, you know, is a, is a uh, it can be monetized by the corporations and exploited without seeing any real benefit on the ground. Um, and also geoengineering solutions, which I oppose. And if you look at the kind of geoengineering solutions that are being pushed, um, they it, it tends to be the people who are pushing them also have IP uh, rights, in other words, patent rights, in a lot of those technologies. And, um, and there is definitely an optic of self-interest and a self-serving uh, commitment. We had one example here in Europe recently, which were the farmers' protests taking place in the Netherlands, because there were environmental rules that came into place about using nitrate fertilizers and so on that were very severe and were appeared to, for the kind of populist, frankly, the kind of voters who might be interested in you, they were very angry about it and they, they took to the streets. And there was this sense that the, the environmental policy wasn't actually paying attention to ordinary people's economic reality. Did you observe that? And do you, where were yeah, you? I, I, my, you know, I, I 
fell on the side of the farmers in that debate because I saw what happened over the years, which I've been fighting, which is that the the increase, the, 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 the power of corporations and this combination of corporate and, and uh, government power, which colluded to get those farmers to switch over to uh, heavily nitrate fertilizer dependent uh, farming and chemical dependent farming. And that was a deliberate, systematic, and GMO farming. And that was deliberate, it was purposeful, and systematic. And so once you get all of those farmers to switch to hydrocarbon-based fertilizers and to monocultures, then you say, okay, those things are bad, and now we're going to shut you all down. So that is what happened. And, you know, I had a, a long conversation on my podcast about this issue with Vandana Shiva, who felt the same way, took the same position I did, that this is a bait and switch, this is a way of destroying the small farmers. And if we want to have democracy, we need a broad ownership of our land by, you know, by a, a, a wide variety of, of yeoman farmers, each with a stake of sis, uh, in our system. That's what Thomas Jefferson said, and wiping out the small farmers and giving control of food production to corporations is not in the interest of humanity. You know, we need to help those farmers transition off you know, the addiction that we imposed upon them in the first place. Another issue that's related to that, which I guess leads us into the Ukraine issue, is the nuclear issue, because that again, having been a to be against nuclear, such as you've been for decades, has been a sort of anti-establishment position. And now suddenly it feels like it's flipping because countries like Germany that have been so strong on, on, on shutting down all their nuclear power are finding themselves vulnerable in that they're overly dependent on Russian gas. And it's now being viewed as an error. I mean, what's your view on that? Have your views evolved on nuclear? No, I mean, my views have always been the same on nuclear. I'm all for nuclear. If they can make it safe and if they can make it economic. Right now, it is literally the most expensive way to boil a pot of water that has ever been devised. We were told that nuke energy would be too cheap to meter and actually it is, uh, it's so expensive that no utility in the world will, have, will build a nuclear power plant without vast public subsidies by the taxpayer. And then in our country, we had to pass the Price-Anderson Act because, you know, I say a nuke is dangerous. It's just dangerous. And it's it's too dangerous for humanity. Look at Fukushima. You know, look at what is happening there now. There is, there's a, there is so much water, contaminated water, that is pouring out and contaminating the entire Pacific Ocean. They're finding those the radiation and fishes all over the ocean. And their only solution is for them to pump the water into these huge tanks and then store it forever. And if you go look at the pictures of Fukushima now, there are these giant, vast tanks that just go on as far as the eye can see. Look at Chernobyl. Now, you know, you may say, well, there's new forms of new power that are safer, which I would say is not true. But but it, don't listen to me. Listen to the insurance industry. Listen to AIG and Lloyd's of London and ask them, will, would you ever uh, insure one of these plants? And they won't. So, you know, until they can buy an insurance policy, they shouldn't be saying it's safe. Buy an insurance in our country, they had to go in in a sleazy legislative maneuver in the middle of the night and pass the Price Anderson Act, which absolve, which shifts the burden of their accidents onto the public. And so, you know, it's not hippies and tie-dyed t-shirts who are saying it's dangerous. It's guys on Wall Street with suits and, and ties who are saying this is this is too dangerous. This is so dangerous that they can't get an insurance policy. And then they have to store the stuff at taxpayer expense for the next 30,000 years, which is five times the length of recorded human history. How can that ever be economic? If they had to internalize the cost, nobody would ever build one of these plants. Nobody would. There's nobody in the world, you know, to build a, a solar plant, a gigawatt of solar now costs about a billion dollars. To build a nuke plant, it's between nine and sixteen billion for one gigawatt for the same thing. 
So it's 16 to nine to 16 times with a capital expense. And then you have to get the uranium that, you know, you have to have these regular outages for maintenance. I just, uh, oh. you know, in, in the European context anyway, France that has such a lot of nuclear is sitting quite pretty now with this uh, Russia situation, whilst Germany has had to restart its coal-fired plants. Well, my solution to that is stop making oil wars. That takes us into this pressing question. One thing that you talk about a lot in your interviews, in your speeches, is America being in a permanent state of war and how you want to put an end to that. Um, with regard to Ukraine, how do you propose to do that? Uh, settle it. I mean, the, the Russians have, have repeatedly offered to settle. And particularly, you know, if you look at the Minsk Accords, um, which the, the Russians, you know, uh, offered to settle for, um, they, uh, you know, that looks like a really good deal today. Oh, you know, the, it's, it's, I mean, let's be honest, this is a U.S. war against, against Russia for geopolitical reasons that have been, you know, these geopolitical machinations that have been going on since 2014 with the, uh, the intelligence agencies and the neocons. And to, to essentially sacrifice the flower of Ukrainian youth in, a, in an abattoir of death and destruction for the geopolitical ambition of the neocons offstated of deposing of regime change for Vladimir Putin and of exhausting the Russian military so that they can't fight anywhere else in the world. And, you know, and that, and, and President Biden has said that that was his intention to depose, to get rid of uh, Vladimir Putin. His Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, in April 2022 said, our, you know, our purpose here is to exhaust the Russian army. Well, what does that mean, exhaust? It means throwing Ukrainians at them. And, you know, the, the, the young, my son fought over there side by side with the Ukrainians. And, you know, we're, we've sacrificed 300,000 Ukrainians. The commander of the special forces unit in the Ukraine, which is probably the most elite and, you know, the, the best fighting force in Europe, arguably, has said that 80 percent of his troops are dead or, or wounded and that they cannot rebuild the unit. Uh, right now, right now, Russians are killing Ukrainians at a rate of a ratio of either one to five or one to eight, depending on what data you believe. If you became president, you would inherit the situation as it is. Um, so although there might be missteps in the past that you regret, the situation as it is, that both sides are very dug in. Public opinion in most of Ukraine is now very violently against Russia and, and vice versa. There is a, a, a front what would the policy actually be to, to basically say territory that Russia has already conquered they can keep? And would you would then be accused of surrendering? Well, well the, you know, what I'm accused of is irrelevant to me, as you may have figured out by now. Um, the, you know, let's do what's sensible, no matter what I'm accused of. Let's do what makes sense, what saves lives. This was supposed to be a humanitarian mission. That's how they sold it to us in the United States. But that would imply that the poor purpose of the mission was to reduce bloodshed and to shorten the conflict. And every step that we've taken has been to enlarge the conflict and to maximize bloodshed. That's not what we should be doing. If you look at the Minsk Accords, it lays the, it sets the groundwork for a final settlement in the Minsk Accords. Uh, the, the Donbass region, which is 80 percent ethnic Russian the, and Russians that were being systematically killed by the Ukrainian government, would become autonomous within Ukraine and would be protected. And I would say, you know, let's protect those populations with a United Nations force or whatever we have to do to make sure the bloodshed stops. Um, in addition to that, we need to remove our Aegis missile systems from which can, can, you know, can house the Tomahawk missile, which is a nuclear missile, 70 miles from the Russian border. When the Russians put nuclear missiles on our in Cuba, you know, 1,500 miles from Washington, D.C., um, we were ready to invade them and we would have evaded them if they hadn't removed them. So, you know, and the way they got removed ultimately is my uncle and, and father 
made a deal with Ambassador Del Brennan and Khrushchev, who they had a close relationship with and they could talk directly to at that point. And they said, and they, the deal was, we will remove our Jupiter missiles from Turkey on your border because we know that's intolerable to you. Russia has been invaded twice in the previous hundred years with the, the vast cost that we can't even comprehend in the United States. And one could see why they wouldn't want U.S. nuclear missile systems in hostile countries on their border. We would all, we would all, we should also agree to keep the to keep NATO out of the Ukraine, which is what the Russians have asked. And I think based upon those three points, we could probably I, somebody like me could settle this war. I don't think the neocons are capable of settling it, and the people who surround President Biden, I don't think they're capable of because they were the ones who created the problems, and I don't think they'll ever recognize that. I think part of a you know a Russian settlement is to recognize that you know um, some of the, um, the the you know some of this history that went into this war with them you know with the geopolitical machinations on both sides, and by the way. I am not excusing or justifying uh, Vladimir Putin's barbaric inv- and illegal invasion of the Ukraine. I'm just saying we need to figure out a way. You know, my uncle always said, if you want to, if you want to actually achieve peace, you've got to put yourself in the other guy's shoes, and you got to figure out the the pressures, the local pressures on him too. I mean, you 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 mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis there, and and your uncle's strategy. You could look at that another way, which is that he stared them down with that. I mean, it was a very frightening moment. Would the would the ships turn around? He played chicken and he won, in a sense, with with that standoff. But there was a real sense that facing that kind of aggression, you have to take a firm stand. And I think it's not just corporate interests. There are lots of good people who feel about the Russian invasion of Ukraine that it is just such a moment and that somehow a stand needs to be taken and he can't be rewarded for it, rather like your uncle did at the Cuban Missile Crisis. What do you say to those people? Well, you know, you can, I can argue the history of it, and I can also argue my uncle, while he was, uh, that his, he was surrounded by a military, by Joint Chiefs of Staff, by an intelligence apparatus that was trying to get him to go to war. And the fact that there was one confrontation where the Russian ship that was carrying supplies to Cuba um, stopped before it hit the kind of the you know the the, the embargo wall of U.S. Uh, of U.S. ships. That wasn't the end of the crisis. That was just a midpoint, and it could have gone anywhere from there. And the the end of the crisis happened because my uncle reached out to Khrushchev directly and said. Let's settle this between ours. And their their settlement was secret, and it remained secret for many years. <clears throat> but my uncle wanted to settle it, and he understood that he had to put himself in Khrushchev's position, and that Khrushchev didn't want war, and neither did he. But they were both surrounded by people who did want to go to war. But what's, what is the wise equivalent thing that the U.S. president should have done when Russian tanks started rolling across Ukrainian borders in three different directions headed well, to the I mean, capital? We, we, we should have listened, uh, maybe, to Putin over many years. You know, we we made a commitment to Russia, to Gorbachev, that we would not move NATO one inch to the east. So, you know, why did we, then we went in and we lied. We went into 13 NATO countries. We put missile systems in that with nuclear that with nuclear capacity. We um, we did joint exercises with the Ukraine and these others for NATO. What is the purpose of NATO? In NATO, this is what you know George Kennan asked. This is what uh, what Jack Matlock asked. All of the you know the doyens of U.S. foreign policy are were saying Russia lost the Cold War. Let's do to Russia for Russia what we did to uh, to Europe with, when we gave them the Marshall Plan. We're the victors. Let's help them lift them up. Let's integrate them into European society. So you would have had Russia I, inside NATO. I, I think that that's something we should have considered. I, you know, what is the purpose of NATO other than to oppose Russia? And if you're if you're if you if you're 
addressing Russia hostily from the beginning, of course, their um, their reaction is going to be a hostile reaction back. And as, if you're slowly moving in, so that all of these states who we said would never be become part of NATO, or suddenly become part of NATO, you know, and and then you know, and we know what happened in the Ukraine, in the U.S. Um, supported a essentially a coup d'etat in 2014 against the democratically elected government of of Ukraine and we put in place and we now have you know the the telephone call transcripts uh, Victoria Nuland one of the neocons in the White House then handpicking the new cabinet that was hostile to the Soviet Union and so you know if you if you look at that and you put yourself in Russia's position And you say, okay, the United States, our biggest enemy that's treating us as an enemy, has now taken over the government of a nation that it and made them hostile to us, and then start, you know, passing laws that are prejudicial to this this giant Russian population. If Mexico did that and then started killing, they killed 14,000 Russians and dumped us, the, the Ukrainian government. If Mexico did that to expatriate Americans, we'd invade in a second. So, you know, I think we have to we have to put ourselves in the shoes of our opponents. And it doesn't mean saying that Vladimir Putin is not a gangster. He is that he's not a thug. He is that he's not a bully. He is. But going to war is not in his interest either. And he repeatedly told us these are red lines you're caught crossing. The the challenge is that we are where we are now and day by day that news emerges of some of the atrocities happening inside the Russian controlled parts of Ukraine and the idea that it's going to slip back to peaceful Minsk style accords is maybe not realistic at this point. So should we take it from what you're saying that in in practice that means your support for NATO as president would be different to what well, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I. But that is something that I'm going to look at as president. I'm going to look at how do we de-escalate tensions between the great powers, between China, between the United States and Russia, and you know how do we, how do we let how do we let these countries deal with their neighbors in a way without pressure from the United States that they're that you know, makes them feel like they're going to have to go into a military mode. And I'm not saying that would happen here. I'm saying that's something that we need to, to look at. And the reason that we need to look at that is we have institutional problems in our country where the, and this might, something my uncle s- discovered in 1960, 61, um, when he said what he realized during the Bay of Pigs crisis is that the CIA had devolved into an agency whose function was to provide the military industrial complex with a, a constant pipeline of new wars. And my uncle came out of one of those meetings as the Bay of Pigs invasion collapsed. And he said, and he realized the CIA had lied to him uh, and he fired ultimately Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, Charles Cabell, Richard Bissell, the three top people of the CIA for lying to him. But he said at that time, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the wind. We have to recognize that, you know, it's not just our civilian agencies that have been captured by industry. The military agencies, the Pentagon, and particularly the intelligence agencies have been captured by the military industrial complex. And, you know, and we have to recognize that and we have to say, okay, we don't want constant wars in our country. We can't afford them. So do you see do you see yourself finishing the job they started then? Do you want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the wind? I think, that, I think the CIA needs to be uh, reorganized in a way. You know, most of the people who work at the CIA are patriotic Americans. They're very, very good um, public servants, and we need them to function. But I think we really need to separate um, the espionage functions of that agency and the plans division, the division that actually does dirty tricks, that kills people, that makes wars, that, you know, um, that in, it, that it involves itself in actions because you can't, because what happens is that tale that the, the um, 
the operations tail begins to wag the espionage dog. The, the term espionage means basically information gathering and analysis, and that is the function that we want the pe- that the CIA was created to perform. I, and very, very early on, Alan Dulles essentially you know, corrupted the purpose of it by by getting the CIA involved in you know assassinations and fixing elections and well, the, the CIA has been involved now in fixing about a, in in coup d'etats or attempted coup d'etats in about a third of the countries in the world, most of them democracy. So our national policy as a country is to promote democracy. The CIA's policy has been the opposite and it has been at odds with the United States. So, and I think part of that, my father recognized this too. His plan was to reorganize the CIA along those lines to separate the espionage and the analysis and information gathering functions um, from the you know the black functions because otherwise the func- the, the the espionage section sees its job as justifying all of these uh, you know these nefarious uh, activities they're involved in and there's no accountability so there's never any accountability and they do you know they, you overthrow a government in Iraq and what happens you create ISIS. You then get involved in Syria from ISIS and you drive two million uh, civilian or two million refugees into Europe, which destabilizes democracy all over Europe and basically causes Brexit. And that is the, you know, that's the outcome of a, of a, what the CIA considers a successful operation to depose Saddam Hussein. Is it really successful? I don't think so. And, and unfortunately, you know, we, we have a 60-year war with Iraq, and that war began when the CIA overthrew the first democratically elected government in the 6,000-year history of Persia. And we are still living with the blowback from that operation. And, and there's no, no accountability, and these agencies need to be accountable, and I would break up the CIA in a way that would make them accountable. If I could just ask more generally, the way you talk about the CIA, the way you talk about a lot of these agencies, emphasizing, as you put it, that people have been lied to, that the heads of these people are, that these organizations are corrupt, that the media is corrupt. At the same time, you talk about how you want to bring people together and you're worried about how divided society is. Is there not a sense that your rhetoric is divisive in that it it, it leads it leads people to believe that a big chunk of their own country is kind of against them. There's like an enemy within in the RFK worldview, and that needs to be destroyed. Is, how do you respond to that sense? The way that you bring people together is by telling people the truth and getting them to agree on facts. If I'm wrong in any of the facts I told you, you, you should challenge me. You know, oh, and other people should challenge me because I really I th- feel that my job is to search for empirical truths and then to be honest with people about it. And because you can't, you know, if you tr- if you try to censor people, if you try to lie to them about what's happening, that our government is broken. If you try to lie about that, it just divides them further. You have to acknowledge, OK, there's a problem. And, you know, I'm a former drug addict. And the first thing that you do, you know, if you want to deal with drug addiction, is you admit there's a problem. And then you can deal with everything. And we need to admit there's a problem in our government before um, before we uh, before we're able to heal it. And, you know, before we're able to heal our country. The, the rot, I guess, in your sense of things goes deep and wide. We're talking about big swathes of the government, as well as the media, heads of corporations. It almost feels a little bit like a revolution when you talk about it, because there must be many, many thousands of people who are in positions of power who you would want out. Do you think of it as a revolution? I think of it as a, yeah, that we need a revolution. I would say that, but a peaceful revolution. And a revolution that, um, you know, that, uh, brings us back to our the values that have been robbed from us you know, over the past 40 years, systematically through, you know, uh, that I watched happen. I mean, I was watching what happened in 1980. 
and we had a functioning government there and we were in the middle of the great prosperity and we had, you know, most Americans trusted the government and, um, and we all trusted the media. And today, 22% of people, Americans trust their government, 22% trust the media. And the reason we have all this mis- blizzard of misinformation, what the, is called misinformation, is because people are looking for other sources of information that they can actually trust because the, the people who are supposed to be giving us good information are not. It's, it's, it's spin, it's propaganda, it's uh, government orchestrated and, uh, and people know it. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows we were lied to about COVID. Everybody knows we were lied to about Vietnam. Everybody knows we were lied to about Iraq. Weapons of mass destruction. You know, it's not this... My opinion about these agencies is not happening in a vacuum. Everybody knows that pharma lied to us about opioids and about Vioxx. You know, I mean, these are not like things that are conspiracy theories that, you know, Robert Kennedy is crazy because he thinks a a corrupted FDA, you know, helped uh, the pharmaceutical companies uh, create the opioid crisis. This is, this is a fact that it, that is well known, well documented, and that happened. And the question is, how are we going to stop it from happening again? And the answer to that is, we got to start by telling the truth about it. My final question to you, Mr. Kennedy, is: We started with vaccines, and in a way, it brings it back to that. Do you think you went too far at any stage? And I'm offering this almost as an opportunity to say to. Democrats who might be interested in you but be freaked out by some of the vaccine stuff. Is there any sense in which you yourself, by fighting so hard on these things, might have lost perspective, might have gone in, gone down the wormhole too far, might have not been confronted or aware of the truth yourself? Do you, do you feel that well, there's a, a danger here, of that? Here's what I would say. Show me where I got it wrong. Show me one fact that I've said in you know all of my social media uh, uh, postings, that was factually erroneous. And if you if you show me that, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fix it. I'll change it. And if I if it's appropriate, I'll apologize for it. But you know that's not what's happened. What's happened is the media has said, "Oh, he passes misinformation." And when I say, "What what piece of misinformation?" Show me one thing that I've ever posted on this subject that is factually incorrect. Everything I post is cited and sourced to government databases and to peer-reviewed publications. You know, I I have probably the most robust fact-checking operation in America today. I have 320 MD physicians and PhD scientists, including until recently Nobel Prize winner uh, Luke Montagnier on our advisory board, looking at everything I post. If I get something wrong, you know, and I, I will ultimately get something wrong but i but so far nobody's been able to show me anything that i've gotten wrong and i i wrote a book on anthony fauci that was the biggest bestseller in america for a year not reviewed anywhere not acknowledged but nevertheless it's almost it's 240,000 words and uh and nobody's been able to find a and i invite people at the beginning and by the way every there's 2200 citations Every one of them with a uh, with a a barcode on it, so that you can go. If you got your telephone there, you can look up the citation while you read the book. And I, I invite people. I invite people at the beginning. Show me anything I got wrong, and you know we've had twelve or fifteen editions. And so, if there was something wrong, we would create it. Uh, we would correct it. But, you know, I don't want to. Sounds like an, an invitation to a second session, maybe, that we can have later in the campaign where we can get stuck happy into the detail of some of the science. Happy to talk about it anytime. You've talked a lot today about the corruption of America, its foreign policy missteps, its internal problems, its internal corruptions. Do you think a good version of America is even achievable anymore? Yeah, I do think it's achievable, and I think it's achievable very quickly. And but I think we need a uh, we need somebody in there who can do what. And I, you know, this is going to sound immodest, but I think only I can do it at this point because I know how to fix these agencies because I've spent so many years litigating against them, so they don't intimidate me. I know in many cases 
who the bad apples are, who the individuals are who have who have uh, misguided it. But I also just uh, I've I've spent my most of my career studying uh, you know the problem of how do you unravel a um, a corrupt agency? How do you fix it? And you know I'm very excited about doing that for my country, and I think. My ultimate ambition is to restore, you know, the faith and the love of America and the pride in America that my children can grow up with the kind of pride that I felt about my country, that I can restore our moral authority around the world and, um, and you know, restore the reputation of America as an exemplary nation as something that the rest of the world can look to as an example and, you know, will want to... Uh, that don't want to copy rather than, you know, a threat. So, uh, you know, my uncle believed um, that America should be a leader, but we should not be a bully. And people understand the difference between those two things. And because my uncle steadfastly avoided war and instead said, I don't want the, 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 the picture of Americans around the world to be somebody with a gun. I want it to be a Peace Corps volunteer. I want it to be the Kennedy Milk Program in all the countries in Latin America and Africa. USAID, which was you know, which was built to uh, to build to to foster the growth of middle class in those countries, and the Alliance for Progress. And because of that, people around the world, um, you know, love John Kennedy more than any president in our history. There's more boulevards named after him, more avenues, more statues to him, more universities and hospitals in Africa and Latin America and all over the world than any other U.S. president. And uh, and that's because he, you know, he had a different vision that was not based on conquering people, but on helping them. Robert Kennedy, thanks for talking to us today. Thanks for having me. That was Robert F. Kennedy Jr., challenger to Joe Biden, to be the Democratic candidate in 2024. For those of you who are hoping we were going to get into the vaccines debate or some of the other COVID controversies, perhaps we'll do that later in the campaign. For now, we wanted to get a broader sense of what his offer was, how it fitted into the political spectrum and the way he thinks about his country in the world. Hope you found it interesting. This was Unheard.